Life on Earth has been nearly annihilated five major times. The planet was in the middle of the comeback of the eon, albeit a slow and placid one. After the near sterilization in the Permian, with some 96% of life wiped clean, life was generally limping along in the form of these invasive generalists like Clariya. This plucky bivalve managed to survive perhaps due to its preference for deep anoxic waters, which were more plentiful after the Permian. On land, the fossil record is dominated by Lystrosaurus, a chunky synapsid that makes up 95% of what we see in the rocks immediately following the Permian disaster. This fat little dude is thought to have been able to exploit the land to a degree not seen by a single species ever before, and not since, until we arrived, that is. It's still something of a mystery why this single synapsid coped so much better than any other species after the Permian swept the land. Now, some have suggested that Lystrosaurus had a burrowing lifestyle and that its broad, deep chest allowed it to thrive in the CO2-heavy air that was somewhat stale, where other organisms would have struggled to catch their breath. Others have suggested that instead, Lystrosaurus was semi-aquatic, and this allowed it to live in these more adaptable states when compared to other species around at that time. It should be noted that there are a few animals that made it through the Permian which were capable of feeding on Lystrosaurus. The swift Moscherinus and the bent-nosed Proterosuchus seem like the only two really up to the task. So it could be that there was simply nothing to curb the explosive growth of Lystrosaurus with nothing to compete with and few to eat it up. Either way, Lystrosaurus would enjoy a long rule essentially all by its lonesome. It would take 30 million years for the planet's biodiversity to recover. If you were to visit this vast period of time, a period 10 times longer than our species has been in existence, you would think you were bearing witness to the end of life on Earth. In the first few million years after the Permian, the sea still burbled at a balmy 40 degrees Celsius and 104 degrees Fahrenheit, and the middle of Pangaea burned at highs of 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. No large animals thrived here, living terrestrial fauna being isolated to the poles. Anoxia in the seas would persist for 5 million years after the Permian mass extinction, potentially contributing to a final aftershock mini extinction pulse around the 2 million year mark after the Great Dying. Part of the problem was it was just too hot. The interior of Pangaea was baked in the sense that virtually no water was able to make it to the center of the supercontinent by way of storm systems. No water means no weathering, making it very difficult to re-sequester that insulating carbon of the atmosphere back into the belly of the earth. In this barren wasteland, few animals, if any, lived. At the poles, Lystrosaurus and their few predators lumbered across a landscape that didn't fare too much better than the equatorial regions. But 20 million years after the disaster that was the Permian mass extinction, something incredible began to happen. It finally began to rain. And not only did the rain fall, but it didn't stop. It was rainy for two million years in a bizarre moment in time that geologists call the Carnian Pluvial Episode. No matter where you go from 234 to 232 million years ago, it would have been a wet and humid climate. 
This is not to say that every day, everywhere, it was raining. Instead, the whole planet experienced an environmental shift from being mostly dry and arid to being wet and moist, allowing it to rain essentially anywhere. This is echoed, weirdly enough, in the geochemistry of the samples that we have. Anywhere you go, you sample from this time period, and you get isotopic ratios that signal to this vastly wet, vastly moist environment. In the cooling and watery landscape, the less populous survivors of the Permian began to diversify. The mid to late Triassic saw the emergence of some enormously enigmatic groups, and the sustained persistence of stragglers from a bygone age. Lungfish and temnospondyls are thriving again in the lakes and rivers of the world, both of which would leave lineages long past the Triassic's end. Cynodonts, a group that includes mammals, eke out a living underfoot of the much bigger and more badass animals. They would get their second chance at the top, but it would not be during the Mesozoic. Early pterosaurs and pterosaur-like animals are beginning to flit about, including the bizarre Charovipteryx, and small diapsids are scrambling along the Pangean forest floors and hanging from the tree limbs in the form of oddballs like Longisquama and Drapanosaurs. The dinosaurs, too, are on the move. The Triassic is home to early theropods, such as Colphysis, but they aren't dominating just yet. Dinosaurs are still relatively small, and they strut about in the shadow of the real rulers of the Triassic, the beasts that preceded the dinosaurs, the Pseudosuchians. If the Triassic is to be characterized by one kind of fauna, it's going to be the Pseudosuchians. These animals are often described as a hyperdiverse group of ancient crocodiles, but to describe them as such would be to undersell their sheer variety. Pseudosuchians are one of the two divisions of Archosauria, and major groups include the largely herbivorous Adosaurs, the terrifying Rauisuchians, and the Phytosaurs, who may or may not be true members. The extinction spike that caps off the Triassic reveals that 75% of life is simply snuffed out. But what on earth happened? The interesting thing about the Triassic is that the mass extinction here is somewhat mysterious. But here's what we know. If you visit the United States, Europe, Northern Africa, or the Amazon, you're going to find a type of volcanic rock that geochemically unites all of these places. And it's dated to an unbelievably precise 201.56 million years of age. This continental flood basalt is not unlike what we saw in the Siberian traps during the Permian mass extinction. Widespread and deep. It has been dubbed the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP for short, and occurred in four primary pulses over the course of 600,000 years. Deadly fast in geology terms. But paleontologist Paul Olson used astronomy, specifically the wobble of the Earth on its axis, to narrow down the dates of this deadly pulse even further. Olson noted that as the Earth's tilt changes, ancient tropical lakes change in tandem every 20,000 years, traced back through time from monsoon to arid and back again. As the climate dries, ancient lakes become shallow, characterized by animal footprints, root systems, and red mudstone. When the monsoons return, the lakes deepen once more and are characterized by laminated black fish fossils, well preserved by the chemistry of the water. Olson was capable of narrowing down the precise layer, corroborated across numerous ancient lakes, that the primary and most deadly pulse of the CAMP occurred in, and it is indeed in a geologic instant, a period of 20,000 years. When mapped out, the camp flood basalt covers almost 4 million square miles, and the majority of this occurred during just a 20,000 year period. This is volcanism on a planetary scale. Valleys would have been filled with roiling magma as the crust of the earth ruptured, molten rock weeping from the wound. Most life would not stand a chance. And this would include plants. As we know quite well by now, as volcanism ramps up, huge amounts of CO2 are unceremoniously dumped into the atmosphere, where they exacerbate heating, 
Plants utilize CO2 in their breathing. They essentially do so using pores that pepper their leaf surfaces. Too many pores will put the plant at risk of drying out under suddenly arid conditions, but too few pores will choke the organism out. As such, these pores are under constant selection by atmospheric carbon dioxide content, making leaves an excellent corroboratory method for atmospheric CO2 content in a given paleo environment. Paleobotanist Jennifer McElwain notes that pore counts of leaves in the end Triassic plummet, suggesting a doubling or even tripling of atmospheric carbon in step with the volcanism we see. As is typical for extinction events, as plant species diversity disappears from the fossil record, generalists take over. One single plant species, a heat-tolerant cypress-like organism, is abundant along the equator for the end Triassic in the stead of the species that thrived there before. The oceans fared little better than the land. Bivalve diversity is halved by the end of the Triassic, and the eel-like conodonts finally fall into extinction. The conodonts to this day are indispensable to the oil industry, as their tiny jaws are associated with oil deposits. Reef systems collapse once again as anoxic, acidic conditions strip the coral of their zooxanthellae, and thus their symbiotic relationship. As the seas heated, some have proposed massive frozen methane stores, much like we see today, were jostled loose. If this truly was the case, no more than 10% of these stores would need to be dislodged in order to amplify the climactic catastrophe by 10 times over. It has additionally been suggested that these massive events of volcanism would have triggered these brief cold snaps. Of course, I say brief in a geological sense, so periods of decades to centuries, and that these snaps would have been very similar to the more brief volcanic winters that we experience today and some of the more intense eruptions of human observation. Olson has briefly posited that these cold periods may have selected for thermoregulatory structures, perhaps resulting in the feathered dinosaurs that would continue to dominate in the Jurassic. With the Pseudosuchians deposed by climatic catastrophe, the survivors would have free reign to radiate out into their empty niches. The forms they would take and the time that they would rule would set the stage for the most famous mass extinction of all time, the KPG mass extinction. But for the next 160 million years, the world would experience the rule of the most charismatic animals of all time, the dinosaurs. Yeah,